Hi guys, this is Dr. Jasmine. Welcome back to JK Dentis. Today we are going to see about occlusion, which is very important topic in the subject of prosthodontics. So let's begin. So occlude means to close according to the dictionary. We are going to learn about occlusion, that is the relationship between maxillary and mandibular teeth. To understand occlusion clearly, we need to know about centric relation, centric occlusion and maximum intercuspation. So we are going to see these terms first to understand about occlusion. So centric relation. Centric relation is a definition you all find it very difficult because GPT-5 is the most acceptable definition of, about centric relation. So let's see about centric relation. But before that, I would like to give in brief about the temporomandibular joint to understand it easily. So this is your condyle. This is a glenoid fossa connecting to the temporal bone. This is connecting to the mandible. There is articular eminence. This is articular eminence. This is articular disc. The central part is the avascular and is the thinnest part of the articular disc while the posterior as well as the anterior part have the blood supply. Now we will move on to the definition. The centric relation, the maxillo-mandibular relation in which condyle articulates with the thinnest avascular portion of the articular disc with the complex in the anterior and superior position against the slope of the articular eminence. Okay? So, this was the one part of the definition. We will break the definition in different parts. Now the further it says is this position is independent of tooth contact. That is this position is bone to bone relation. Okay. It is not tooth to tooth relation. Okay. This is very important for the point of view of MCQs. Then comes this position is clinically discernible. Okay. That means it is clinically noticeable and it is repeatable, recordable and learnable position. Okay, when the condyle is in superior and posterior position. Then this position is purely rotary around the transverse horizontal axis. So, whole definition was been split in different parts. So, what it says, it is purely rotary. So, first we will see what do you mean by rotation movement. Okay, so this is the disc and this is the condyle. Rotation means rotation of the condyle in its own axis. To understand rotation, you can have an example of a car. You can see the car has wheels. The wheels are rotating at the same place. Still, the car is moving. So, the rotation of the wheel will be considered as a rotational movement while the distance covered by the car will be the translation. So, when the condyle is moving at its place, but there is one more important thing about the rotation. There is hinge movement. What is hinge movement? When the mouth opening is about 20 to 25 mm, the rotation of the condyle occurs 13 degree. Okay? This much opening, that is 20 to 25, and the rotation is about 13 degree. That is the rotation of the condyles. But when the condyle changes its position by gliding the path of glenoid fossa, then it is called as translation and this, this position occurs beyond 40 mm, okay, 40 mm. So this is about rotation and translation. Now we will see about centric occlusion. So centric occlusion is the maximum contact of the teeth, okay, maxillary and mandibular teeth but in centric relation. That means when the teeth are contacting, the condyle will be in centric relation. Okay? And there is maximum intercuspation. It means the contact of the teeth in maximum intercuspation, but here the condyle will not be in centric relation. Okay? So, the centric occlusion, maximum times the condyle will be in centric relation, but in maximum intercuspation, it can or cannot be in centric relation. The centric relation is also called as terminal hinge position or ligamentous position. The centric occlusion is also con called as convenience occlusion while the maximum intercuspation is called as habitual or acquired position. So in most of the patients you will see maximum intercuspations. Sometimes it can relate to the centric relation in 10% of cases. So it is also important for the point of view of MCQs. 
So I have told in short about centric relation, centric occlusion, and maximum intercuspation. Now we will move on to different types of occlusion. So the occlusions are basically of different types like we can see here I have mentioned balanced occlusion, monoplane occlusion, neutrocentric, lingualized and lineal occlusion. So these are the different types of occlusion. So we are going to see in detail about the balanced occlusion. Okay. Before starting the balanced occlusion, I will enumerate all the other type of occlusions. Okay. So monoplane occlusion. In the monoplane occlusion, zero degree teeth are being used. Okay. So the angulation of the teeth is zero degree. And in the monoplane teeth, both the arches, we are going for zero degree teeth. Then comes neutrocentric occlusion. In this, we are directing the force centralized to the area of basal seat area. For that, we need to maintain proportion position, the form, the number and the pressure. So it is based on P3FM. You can remember the term is as P3FM. So you need to control these factors for maintaining neutrocentric occlusion. Then comes lingualized occlusion. In the case of lingualized occlusion, we contact the lingual cusp to the wider central fossa. So here the wider central fossa and the contact is by only the lingual cusps. Okay. Then comes lineal occlusion. In the lineal occlusion there is knife edge cusp. Okay. And of the one arch and the opposing arch has zero degree monoplane teeth. That is lineal occlusion. So in short, I have enumerated about the different types of occlusion. Now we will move on to balanced occlusion. What do you mean by balanced occlusion? Before moving to balanced occlusion, we will see about Christensen's phenomena, which is seen in natural dentition. So what is Christensen's phenomena? When we are bringing our anteriors to edge to edge, that is like this. I have got my teeth edge to edge, that is protrusion. By protrusion, we bring the anterior teeth edge to edge, we get posterior separation and that separation is called as Christensen's phenomena. Secondary, when we move to the lateral or right side you can say or to the left side we get the separations by canine guided occlusion. What it is? That is when I am moving mandible to the working side. So for this working side. If I am moving my mandible to the right side like this so this is my working side and this is my balancing or non-working side. So in this, your mandible is moved to the right side. So this is considered as working side and this is considered as non-working side. So when I'm moving my mandible to the right side, there will be only contact with the right side canines and rest all other will not be in contact. Similarly, on the other side. Okay, so I have explained you about working side as well as non-working side. So this was all about Christensen's phenomena natural dentition but now I will see about the dentures. There we cannot follow the Christensen's phenomena. We need to go for balanced occlusion. Why we need to go for balanced occlusion? Because imagine if you are giving a denture to the patient. They don't have the support like the natural teeth. So when they will bring the teeth forward that is edge to edge. Imagine that. There will be posteriorly the denture will get lifted which we don't want. That's why we require contact in all the sides that is anterior position, anterior posterior as well as we can say the centric as well as the eccentric contacts. All the areas of the teeth must be in contact. That is balanced occlusion. Okay. So balanced occlusion we will study about Thelman formula. But before moving on to the Thelman formula, there are five main terms. Okay. So earlier, Hanau gave nine keys. Okay. So there was earlier nine keys. Later on, he eliminated the four. And then came five main factors. Okay. The five main factors of the Hanau's squint is being used in the Thelman's formula. Okay. Now we will see what are they. The first is the condylar guidance. 
So first is condyler guidance. So the angle, this is, I have shown you the condyles, when the condyle translates, the angle made by the condyle by translation is the condylar guidance. And how you get the condylar guidance? You take a protrusive bite of the patient to know the condylar guidance, okay? Secondly, the condylar guidance is cannot be changed, okay? It is fixed in a patient, but it will vary in different patient to patient. How it will vary? If I have a broad mandible, the condylar guidance will be different. In a thin narrow mandible, the condylar guidance will be different. So it will vary patient to patient, but it is fixed enti entity and it is not in the dentist's hand. Okay. Then comes the incisal guidance. Okay. So this is my tooth. Okay. I will draw it. And this is the margin of usual plane. So, what is incisal guidance? It is the angle made by the anterior upper as well as the lower teeth. So, the angle made by the edges of the upper and lower teeth. So, you can see that this is the angle. This angle is the incisal guidance angle. Okay. There is another way of calculation of incisal guidance by the Swenson's formula. We will see about the Swenson's formula later on. So this was about incisal guidance and secondly our incisal guidance depends on overbite and overjet. So in my diagram you can see that this will be the horizontal inclination will be overjet you know jet planes on a pl single horizontal plane and this is over bite so you can remember it the bite word is for the vertical inclination that is the bite and the jet is for the horizontal inclination so our incisal guidance is mainly dependent on over bite as well as the over jet it is important for the point of view of mcqs we will see that later on how to solve the mcqs related to that then comes the third as plane of occlusion. So the plane of occlusion is parallel to chamfer's line. Okay. So the chamfer's line starts from the ala of the nose till the superior part of the tragus. Okay. You should remember that. While the normal ala tragus line starts from the ala of the nose and it can be anywhere on the part of the tragus. Okay. Not superior. So, this plane of occlusion is parallel to this line, okay. So, we can modify the plane of occlusion. Yes, you can. But, you cannot make it like this, a steeper one, or you cannot make it like this. You can change the occlusal plane at a degree of 10, okay. Not more than 10, okay. This was about plane of occlusion. Then, it comes as compensating curves. So, there are anteroposterior compensating curve and a lateral curve. Anteroposterior compensating curve is the curve of SP. Okay, so curve of SP starts from the tip of the canine. It follows the buccal cusp of the posterior teeth and it follows further the ramus of the mandible and then it's in the condylar region. Okay, that is the curve of SP. We have to maintain the curve of speed during our teeth arrangement to get the proper balance assembly. Okay. This is anterior posterior curve. Then comes a medium lateral curve that is a curve of Wilson. So as you know, the in the lower teeth are inclined lingually. Okay. They are like this. That's why your buccal cusp is prominent while your lingual cusp is not that prominent okay so you can see that it is something like that and there is a curve followed by it okay that is the curve of wilson and it is mediolateral curve okay this follow like this okay so this was about uh, wilson curve there are some other curves like uh, pleasure curve and uh, and the monsoon curves, we will see that later. So, there we have covered about the compensating curve. Now, we will see about the cusp 
angulation. So there are three types of teeth. There are anatomic, non-anatomic and semi-anatomic. Anatomic teeth have 30 de 33 degree angulation. The semi-anatomic have 20 degree angulation while the non-anatomic are the zero degree we can say that and we are using in monoplane occlusion. So we will see how it is 33 degree angulation and how we get to know the teeth are 33 degree angulated. So you can see that we draw a line at the deepest part of the fossa. So when you see the angulation from the cusp, it comes to be as 30 degree, 33 degree in the anatomic teeth. While when it comes to semi-anatomic teeth, the angulation will come to be 20 degree. And when it comes to monoplane teeth, there will not be any angle. It will be approximately like zero. So it is about the semi anatomic anatomic and zero degree teeth. But there is one more category which have 30 degree angulation that is called as Pilkington Turner tooth. Okay, it is very important for the point of view of meat. Okay, remember that 30 degree angulation teeth. So can we modify the angulation for the balanced occlusion? Yes, you can modify the cusp or you can say the inclines to attain a balanced occlusion. So now we will see how Thilman has related it. Okay, so Thilman have given a formula that is compensating, sorry, condylar guidance, incisal guidance and to the other side there is plane of occlusion, there is compensating curves and there is cusp angulation, okay. So, this entity is fixed, okay. Rest all can be changed and we need to maintain a balance between both sides. That is our purpose. So, if there is one question, if the condylar guidance has increased, if it increases, if it is steep, steep means increase, shallow means decrease. So, if the condylar guidance is increased, what will happen to the plane of occlusion? These terms are directly proportional, so the plane of occlusion will increase. If it is asked about compensating curves, it will also increase. Okay, so if it is steep, these terms will increase. But if the question is being asked like, if it is steep, what will happen to the incisal guidance? Or it can be asked as, what will happen to the over jet? Okay, as you know, the incisal guidance is mainly formed by the overjet as well as the overbite. If the condylar guidance has increased, we need to decrease the incisal guidance to maintain the balance between both of the proportions because if everything will increase, we cannot maintain the balance. If the condylar guidance is increased, our rest of the assemblies will also increase. So we need to decrease this to maintain the balance. So incisal guidance will decrease. What will happen to the overjet and the overbite? I will tell you with an example. If this is the tooth, this is the plane, this is the angulation. Now in this case, you will see this is the angulation. And then the second case, you can see that. When we have to decrease the incisal guidance, we need to increase the overjet and decrease the overbite. You can see that there is increased overjet and decreased overbite. But if we have to increase the incisal guidance angle, then we have to do exactly opposite. We need to decrease the overjet and increase the overbite. Okay? So the question can be asked in any way. So you should be able to solve if it is asked about overbite, if it is asked about overjet and if it is directly asked about the incisal guidance. Now there is one more thing that is Swenson's formula. So Swenson's formula says that incisal guidance is equals to 2 into cusp angulation minus the condylar guidance. So if you have cusp angulation like if you are using the anatomic T 33 degree minus if the condylar guidance after calculation of the protrusive bite comes to be 30. Okay, so it will be 63 minus 30 that is it will be about approximately 36. So your incisal guidance will be 36 degree. So in this way 
you have to use the Swenson's formula as well as the Thinman formula to solve the MCQs. Okay. So I have covered about centric relation, what is centric occlusion, maximum intercuspation, what is rotation, what is translation, working side, non-working side, Christensen's phenomena, and also the different types of occlusion about Thinman formula as well as the Swenson's formula. I hope you have understood the topic. I tried to cover as much as possible. If you have any doubts, please mention in the comment box. I will try to solve all your doubts. Please don't forget to press the subscribe button. Thank you so much.